Hi everyone, my name is David Williams and I'm going to be discussing In the Shadow of the Dam, the aftermath of the Mill River Flood of 1874, written by Elizabeth M. Sharp. Elizabeth Sharp grew up 17 miles from Haydenville, hearing stories from her father about her great-great-grandfather's shop that was swept away in the flood. She has a doctorate in American history from the University of Delaware, and she was the former director of education at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. Her book is a very detailed book laying out exactly what happened at the Mill River Flood of 1874. It goes through an introduction of the Mill Valley in Massachusetts. It goes through the background of the dam construction uh, and then goes into a detailed account of what actually happened on May 16th, 1874. Then it discusses the aftermath, rebuilding process, uh, the community's inquest into who was responsible as well as the verdict and changes that came about as a result of the disaster. Some quick background information. The Mill Valley is located in western Massachusetts and it's named for the 15 mile long Mill River that flows into the Connecticut River. Now the Mill River is known for its pretty tight spacing coupled with steep slopes and waterfalls creating some fairly strong currents. Now the Mill Valley consists of five main townships located along the river. Williamsburg, Skinnerville, Haydenville, Leeds, and Florence, which was a secondary town. Now, the townships were highly dependent on their manufacturing mills and factories. They were the primary source of jobs. Their owners were especially charitable, donating uh, various buildings, government buildings, church buildings, etc. And the mills also necessitated a secondary sector that would provide food, shopping, uh, clothing, etc. for the labor force of the primary sector. So there was a great deal of job creation from these mills and factories. However, they needed water power to sustain themselves. By 1880, six New England states accounted for 33% of America's water power. Unfortunately, the Mill River was inconsistent with its current. So they decided to build a dam to fix this. So 11 mill owners in the four principal townships formed the Williamsburg Reservoir Company in hopes of raising the $30,000 between them. The site was selected. They commissioned Lucius Finn, an engineer for a railroad company, to design the dam, even though he never designed one before. The original plan was to go with a st stone dam, but it was too expensive for the company, so they decided on an earthen dam as an alternative. And it needs to be said that there were no building codes, no standards set forth by the government during the 1960s in regards to building dams. Now on the left you see the original design by Finn, and on the right you'll see the final design that was a compromise for the owners. You'll notice a couple foreboding uh, changes that they make. The original in inner masonry wall is supposed to be built into a 5 foot trench, but instead they negotiated him down to a 3 foot trench. Also, the horizontal base to vertical height ratio is supposed to be 2 to 1, but instead they made it one one and a half to 1, which increased the degree of the slope of the dam, which is not good. It allows for less strength in the dam. And they simply told Finn to reassure him they'll fix it afterwards. The construction contract was awarded to Bassett and Wells, who thought they could build the dam for $22,000. In the middle of the project, after they'd already sunken in $8,000, one of the directors told them that they were going to use a 16-inch gate pipe instead of the standard 18-inch that was called for in the design. The problem with that is the gate pipe is what releases water downstream. If it's a smaller pipe, then that means there's a lot more pressure on it when it's releasing water, which is not good. It can easily burst because of that. Another issue was finding hard pan, which is essentially hard bedrock, which won't allow for any kind of leaks. They couldn't find any hard pan, and they expected that it would cost another $150 to do so, so the owners told them not to bother, and they just established the dam on top of gravel, essentially, which does not hold water very well. Bassett, one of the contractors, confided in a co-worker after the fact, saying he wouldn't give a dollar for all the property in the valley because of this. The construction by Bassett and Wells was shoddy at best. The core wall was built during the winter months, and that's not a good thing when you're using grout, which doesn't bind well during freezing temperatures. This meant that it wouldn't adequately insulate the wall from water. Another issue 
they didn't remove all the organic matter from the earthen materials for the dam, which means there's little tiny spaces in between where water can leak through, which as a dam, you don't want it to leak at all. And finally, uh, one of the biggest problems with the construction process was the engineer left shortly after the start of it, which left little accountability for the contractors. The only law in Massachusetts regarding dams was the Mill and Reservoir Dams Act of 1854, which allowed for county commissioners who had no special training to inspect the con construction or finished product of a dam if they were petitioned by the reservoir company or concerned citizens. The problem was all fees had to be paid by the petitioner if the dam was deemed safe, which did not incentivize concerned citizens to speak out. Now the public was well aware of the shoddy nature of the construction effort and the design effort, but as you can imagine they were fearful of going and petitioning the inspection because the ridiculous law that required them to pay any fees if they were wrong. And that's an issue, a very big issue. The author's portrayal of the flood is truly gut-wrenching and quite frankly frustrating when you realize what took place to make this come about. The negligence, the greed, it's really frustrating. And you can, you can see that 139 people died, 43 of them were children, and 12 men found out their entire families were wiped out in a single flash. And in all, it was an estimated $1 million in property losses. Now this is just one paragraph out of 37 pages recounting the actual flood event. I just opened the book and this is what it came to. The whole chapter is like this. A very detailed account of who lived, who died, how they died, how they survived. It's truly gut-wrenching to read. And I suggest you just read this just to get an idea for how deeply devoted she is to portraying this as in-depth as possible. Now, while there was a great outpouring of support from the surrounding area and even the country, Mill Valley never really recovered. They lost many of their mill owners, their, the mills and the factories. They moved on to better opportunities, and the Mill Valley just simply could not recover from this disaster. It was determined by a community inquest group that delinquent legislation the mill owners themselves, the engineers, the contractors, and the county commissioners were at fault for this disaster. Now, they may have been found guilty, but they were never punished, especially the mill owners. These were the same people that provided countless jobs and economic opportunities for the communities. They, the communities were almost pleading with these mill owners to stay in the towns so that they could keep the jobs coming. So there was no punishment whatsoever. Now there were some pretty substantial changes that took place as a result of the disaster. Among others, uh, New England states started imposing legislation that required dam inspections to be undertaken by competent engineers as opposed to untrained people. It also led to an improved status for engineering as a result of this. Another change is one of the first instances where the Massachusetts legislature provided relief funds, which could be seen as a very important event in uh, emergency management history. And as a result of the Mill River Dam failure and others like it, the industry started shying away from water power and taking up steam power instead. And probably one of the biggest changes, the biggest attitude changes, is the public now saw businessmen as self-interested capitalists who were very greedy and very negligent as opposed to self-made men who were completely moral and upright. I thought the author did an amazing job of detailing exactly what happened during the Mill River Flood of 1874. The background information, the information after the flood, and especially the actual flood itself. So much detail and sometimes it can get bogged down in the details, but all in all the the book is amazing. It reads like a novel. It's got heroes who come to save the day. It's got villains who act in their own self-interest and their greed. And it, it can be a case study of what can go wrong when you let capitalism run without any kind of regulations whatsoever. You see the, the consequences of uh, capitalists, of industrialists running rampant without any kind of government sanctions. And it shows that there is need for, for emergency management 
and there is need for standards and regulations. And it's just a great book for anyone interested in disasters or in emergency management. And here are my references. I hope you enjoyed my presentation. I look forward to your questions. Thank you.